friends so today's topic of discussion is retention and relapse stability of orthodontic treatment outcome has been a topic of great interest because maintaining teeth in their corrected positions after treatment is often the most challenging part of an orthodontic treatment plan usually uh, the corrected teeth tends to move back towards the original malocclusion so this is called relapse and relapse could be considered as any unfavorable change in tooth position after orthodontic treatment away from a corrected malocclusion to prevent relapse we have to plan uh, certain retention protocols so retention and the potential for relapse must form a key part of the orthodontic treatment plan so uh, i'll be focusing mainly on the definition of relapse and retention causes of orthodontic relapse schools of retention theorems of retention six keys for lower retention and different types of retainers and some adjunctive procedures to aid in retention so before going into the details of the retentions and schools of retention and theorems of retention let's see what is relapse so According to Moyers, relapse is the loss of any correction achieved by orthodontic treatment. And Lowe stated, relapse is a histogenetic and morphogenic response to some anatomical and functional violation of an existing state of anatomic and functional balance. According to Webster, slipping back or falling back into former bad state, that is called relapse. So, simply put, relapse is a rebound movement in which teeth recoil back somewhere close to their original positions. So to avoid any kind of relapse tendency, we plan retention protocols early in the treatment planning itself uh, to um, hold the tooth in the corrected position for a longer period of time. And uh, retention, it can be defined as the phase of orthodontic treatment which maintains the teeth in their orthodontically corrected positions following the cessation of active orthodontic tooth movement. For that, you can use various retention appliances called retainers. There are different types of retainers like removable, fixed and aesthetic retainers. Also, there are certain adjunctive procedures which will enhance the post-treatment stability. All these things will be discussed in detail later. Moving on, let's see what are the causes of relapse. Relapse basically compromises the post-treatment stability and there are several destabilizing factors which leads to relapse. Rayton categorized these destabilizing factors into four. They are soft tissue factors, supporting tissue factors, occlusal factors and facial growth and occlusal development. First one is the soft tissue factors. As we already discussed in the muscular school of thought, there should be a balance between the intraoral and extraoral musculatures surrounding the jaws and teeth. If any abnormal muscular function or active soft tissue pressures will result in an abnormal skeletal configuration as well as dentoalveolar relationship. So for long term stability, you should end up with a uh, harmonious muscle function with passive soft tissue pressures. So next one is the forces from supporting tissues teeth are supported by alveolar bone periodontium and gingiva so they are the supporting tissues so uh, they consist of several fibers such as periodontal fibers and gingival fibers so when we move teeth applying orthodontic force not only the tooth moves but also the supporting structures such as the bone periodontal fibers and gingival fibers gets remodeled and these structures require certain period of time to adapt and reorganize within the new position otherwise the stretch of these fibers can tend to move the teeth back to its original position so to avoid this we need to consider the time period required for them to reorganize as you can see on the screen the principal fibers of periodontal ligament require 83 days for reorganization and collagenous fibers of the gingiva require 147 days for reorganization and elastic fibers of the gingiva that is the supracrystal fibers uh, they require around 232 days for reorganization so they are known to have a uh, longest amount of time to reorganize when alveolar bone it takes five to six months for reorganization so the important point to be noted here is that in case of severe 
derotated tooth, severely derotated tooth. The supracrystal gingival fibers are uh, severely stretched. And after derotating the teeth, you have to use a prolonged retention since these crystal gingival fibers are known to take the longest amount of time to reorganize. So the third one is the occlusal factors. It includes proper intercuspation, tooth size, arch length relationship, and normal inclination and angulation of individual tooth and all this comes under occlusal factors. So if you are ended up with a prop, uh, ended up the treatment with a proper occlusion with perfect intercuspation near ideal or normal inclination and angulation of individual tooth without any sagittal vertical or transverse discrepancies and with harmonious tooth size arch length relationship you will not face much retention problems and post treatment stability will be much better last category is the facial growth especially the post treatment facial growth it's a reality that facial growth continues throughout adult life and you can expect a uh, certain amount of growth even after your treatment is over. So this post-treatment facial growth can alter the outcome of your treatment either in a favorable way or in an unfavorable manner. So you should be assessing the growth pattern and reminding growth beforehand and your retention protocol should be planned accordingly. Post-treatment occlusion responds to the growth changes. That's why uh, you get an uh, altered treatment outcome after 2-3 years of uh, treatment. So, why retention is necessary? So, the major three points, these are already uh, we discussed under causes of relapse. So, uh, what are the three major points first one is the bone and adjacent tissues require time for reorganization soft tissue pressures constantly produce relapse tendency and changes produced by growth may alter the orthodontic treatment results so because of all these things retention is necessary so for many years clinicians did not agree about the need for retention but over the years different people came up with different philosophies uh, they say that uh, if you achieve any of these following characteristic feature post treatment, then your results will be stable. So the set of these different philosophies are called schools of retention. So the first one is the occlusion school by Kingsley. So Kingsley stated occlusion is the most potent factor in determining the stability in a new position. That is uh, when you have a perfect uh, occlusion with perfect intercuspation then your post treatment stability will be much more than normal the second school was the apical base school by alex lindstrom so he suggested that the apical base was one of the most important factor in the correction of malocclusion and maintenance of a corrected occlusion so many others also supported his view that is makule who supported this by stating that intercanine and intermolar root should be maintained as originally presented to minimize retention problems. Nance also stated arch length cannot be permanently increased to a major extent. So basically in this school they say that maintaining intercanine and intermolar width that is the apical base width enhances the post treatment stability. Third one is the mandibular incisor school by Greve and Tweed. According to them, mandibular incisors should be placed and kept upright over basal bone to maximize the stability. So, if you place lower incisors upright over the basal bone, they are likely to remain in good alignment. So, placing upright means when we draw post treatment set, the long axis of the lower incisor should be perpendicular to the mandibular plane. Um, but plus or minus 5 degree uh, variation is acceptable. So placing this, uh, these mandibular incisors upright or 90 degrees to the mandibular plane upright over basal bone gives you better stability. So the last school is the musculature school by Rogers. This philosophy is based on the equilibrium theory 
and buccinative mechanism. As you all know that teeth are uh, ideally should be placed in a neutral zone where pressures from outside that is by the cheeks and the lips and pressure from inside that is by the tongue should be equal and teeth should usually placed in a neutral zone. So if, uh, if you place teeth in the neutral zone post treatment then you don't need to worry about relapse. So these are the four schools of retention. These are very important. That is first one is occlusion score by Kingsley where he stated that occlusion is the most important uh, part in maintaining stability. Then second one was the apical base school by Lundstrom. So where he told that maintaining uh, intercanine or intermolar with apical base width is the key for retention. And third one is the mandibular school by Grieve and Tweed. According to them, placing mandibular incisors upright over basal bone is the key for retention. And the fourth one is the musculature school by Rogers where he considered uh, establishment of proper muscular balance is the key for stability. So the next one is uh, one of the very important part of this topic that is theorems of retention. There are 10 theorems in which first 9 theorems are proposed by Richard A. Riedel and the 10th one is proposed by Moyers. So let's see what is the first theorem. The first theorem states that teeth that have been moved tend to return to their former position. So as you can see in the first picture which is a pre-treatment photograph of a patient with lower anterior crowding uh, with serial extraction has already done. So, so the second picture is the post-treatment photograph where you got a perfectly aligned lower anteriors. And the third picture is the retention period when the patient returned with a mild crowding in the anterior. So this is a perfect example of relapse. Because we didn't follow up with a proper retention protocol, the case ended up like this. So this is what the first theorem says. That is the teeth that have been moved tend to return to their former positions. This is what the first theorem says. And so basically first theorem is a reality check that we cannot achieve a perfect finish in every case. Because there are chances to relapse. So the second theorem states that elimination of the cause of malocclusion will prevent relapse. So malocclusions can have several etiologic factors and usually most of the malocclusion associated with abnormal habits such as tongue thrusting, mouth breathing, and thumb sucking etc. So when you eliminate or break these habits before going for a corrective orthodontic treatment, you can prevent relapse. If you are not bothered to eliminate or remove the cause or the etiology and do the rest of the treatment you will end up with the same problem again that is the patient will come to you with the same problem again this is because the cause that etiology is still present so elimination of the malocclusion is very important while treating the patient The theorem 3 which emphasizes on the overcorrection. It says that malocclusion should be overcorrected as a safety factor. As you can see in the picture there is a mesiolingually rotated lower canine on the left side. So your goal is to derotate the canine and may make it in, in alignment with the other teeth. But instead of that you can uh, what you can actually do is that you can slightly rotate the canine to the opposite side so that even if relapse, relapse happens uh, it will be occupying the correct position so this is called overcorrection the point to be noted here is uh, it's not possible to overcorrect every malocclusion the fourth theorem it explains the role of occlusion so it says that occlusion is a potent factor in holding teeth in corrected positions so this theorem is in accordance with the occlusion school of thought by Kingsley. So we have already discussed uh, what is the role of occlusion and retention. That is if you have a proper occlusion with perfect intercuspation, uh, your, there is a less retention problem post-treatment.
moving on to the fifth theorem this theorem emphasizing the role of supporting structures such as bone and adjacent tissues this also we have discussed in detail uh, under the causes of relapse so it states that bone and adjacent tissues should be given enough time to reorganize so the theorem 6 is in accordance with the mandibular incisal school by tweed that is uh, this theorem states that lower incisor should be placed upright over basal bone that is the inclination of lower incisor should be 90 plus or 90 degrees plus or minus 5 degrees to the mandibular plane or to the basal bone so that uh, you will have better stability theorem 7 is uh, related to growth it says correction carried out during periods of growth are less likely to relapse it is actually telling us that do treatment on growth period that is in adolescence it's actually easier to do treatment when growth is still present and adult orthodontics is difficult and more challenging for orthodontists as well as for the patient patient himself so it's also advocating you to go ahead with interceptive and preventive orthodontics rather than corrective and surgical orthodontics moving on theorem 8 this is actually similar to theorem 3 that is overcorrection. It says that the farther teeth have been moved, the less likelihood of relapse. So you can take the same example of rotated teeth where we do overcorrection. Means you rotate the tooth in the opposite direction fearing the relapse. So um, according to theorem 9, mandibular arch form cannot be permanently altered by treatment. Treatment should be directed towards maintaining the arch form presented by the malocclu uh, malocclusion as much as possible. Any attempt to alter the mandibular arch form, there will be very high chances for relapse. Uh, so the two major dimensions to be considered uh, here are the intercanine width and the intermolar width. So we should always establish them as fixed quantities and build the arches around them so that you get a better stability post treatment. So move on to the last theorem which is proposed by Moyers. So it says that many treated malocclusions require permanent retaining devices. So the permanent retainers are the fixed bonded lingual retainers. So most commonly used for mandibular incisors and cases of midline diastema etc. So this type of retention is supposed to be there for lifelong. That's why it's called permanent retainer. So these are the 10 theorems of retention uh, out of which 9 are proposed by Radel and the 10th one is proposed by Moyers. Apart from these, there is a Raleigh Williams keys for enhancing the lower retention. This actually relates to incisors and canines, inclinations and angulations. So the first key tells you about the labiolingual positioning of lower incisors in relation to a pogonion line. So your lower incisor edge should be exactly on the epogonion line or one amount in front of it uh, post treatment. Not more than that. So that uh, you will get better stability post treatment. The second key talks about the mesiodistal angulation how you should end up post treatment to get maximum stability the basic idea is to have enough bond between the roots that is the lower incisor apices should be spread distally to the crowns more than is generally considered appropriate and the apices of the lower lateral incisors must be spread more than those of the central incisors so there are three ways you can have your lower incisors uh, as you can see on the picture, out of the three, uh, the third picture should be the appropriate positioning of lower incisors where the roots of the incisors are slightly distally tipped or rather you can say it's in a diverging fashion. So you can get better stability. The third key, uh, it is highlighting about the lower canines. So it emphasizes that the apex of the lower canine should be positioned distal to the crown. The fourth key says that 
when you look from top or the occlusal view all your incisor roots should be in the same labiolingual plane so that you should not be seeing any root flaring or uh, root apex going front or back or like that so the uh, and also the crowns should be straight so the fifth key highlights the root apex of lower canines must be positioned slightly buckled to the crown that is root of the lower canine should slightly incline outwards and the crown uh, should be uh, slightly inclined inwards so this is actually um, opposite to the fourth key where um, unlike the incisors mentioned in the fourth key where the it says the incisors should be straight that is the roots of the incisor should be in the same labiolingual plane so the sixth key says that the lower incisors should be slenderized as needed after treatment so when you finish the case well aligned because of the shape of the lower incisor you get point contacts between them due to this point contacts they can slip past each other so if you want more retention it's all, always advisable to increase these cont contact areas so the best way is to convert these contact points into contact areas by slenderization or proximal stripling between the anteriors when you do slenderization in the finish, finishing stage you will get more stable relation so these are the six keys of uh, six keys for enhancing the lower retention which is proposed by rally williams thank you guys for watching so that was the first part of this topic and i'll be back with the second part soon and i thank dr zahi for giving me this opportunity have a good day